Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 193, where we chat with Chris Colton and hear his very different journey to financial independence. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my blather Skype co-host, Scott Tretch. Thanks for always keeping me in line with these intros, Mindy. <laughs> Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, lose 100 pounds, completely rebuild your financial position, or pay off $144,000 in debt, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so that you can launch yourself towards your dreams. Okay, in the intro, we said we want to introduce you to every money story, and today's guest definitely has a different story than you've heard before here. Chris Colton is a 49-year-old electrician who dropped out of both high school and college and spent some time as a homeless drug addict until figuring out that that might not be the most productive life path. His newfound faith helped him turn it around and become a responsible husband and father. Dave Ramsey and his Baby Steps program helped him shed almost $150,000 in debt, and now he is on his way to financial independence. In his words, I corner every young person on every job and give lectures about retirement. I hand out total money makeover books like their Tic Tacs. Scott, I am so excited to talk to Chris today because we haven't had this story before. And Chris is, he's led a pretty interesting life. Yeah. Th I mean, this is just a incredible financial journey. And, you know, we, we, we bring in folks from all different backgrounds and different, you know, journeys with money here. This is the most amazing money story. You know, I, it, maybe, maybe um, Tony Gaiden episode where, where he lost what like 150 pounds, that, 200 what, what, pounds? maybe more than that I thought he lost a, 200 yeah, pounds significant yeah. amount. and you know was 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 working the night shift at walmart maybe, maybe that's that's in the same ballpark but oh my gosh what chris has achieved here is remarkable given where he started and the the challenges that he faced you know in his past with this and it's it's incredible one hundred forty four thousand dollars in debt you know dr drug addict and homeless um, different, several different career changes. And now just to see the life that he's built and the position that he's in and the happiness and joy that he has and the gratitude about the position he finds himself in today is it's incredible. And I, I can't wait for you to hear it. Chris Colton, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I cannot wait to share your story. Let's jump right into it. Where does your journey with money begin? Um, so my personal finance starts off with a personal note because I am a recovering addict. And so we have to start off there. When I was a, a young man, I ran away from home, uh, sleeping on the streets, just kind of got into the whole drug thing. And that lasted quite a long time until I met uh, my wife now, Tana. Um, it was a whole thing of selling cars. I don't know if you know anything about car salesmen, but they have a little bit of a sinus problem can right um so when i woke up one morning 3 a.m there's a poker game in my living room uh i'd moved away to chico to try to get away from the drugs and there was a poker game a mountain of cocaine and i was just i can't do this and i called my girlfriend then who's now my wife and she was in santa cruz she got in her car drove down there and pulled me out saved me i mean drove me back to, with her and uh and that kind of changed everything, right? Um, so when I got back to Santa Cruz with her, I sold my skateboards, my snowboards, my wakeboards, all my toys, and bought some bags. And and uh, when I was in one of those, um, one of the meetings, right, one of the 12-step meetings, uh, somebody said, yeah, you need to walk into a hiring hall to if you're looking for work. And so, you know, me being the genius that I am, just walked into the first one I found, happened to be the Carpenters. And just like that, I became a bridge builder. Got sold all my stuff, bought my bags, got my tools, and started working. So now I've got actual income from actual work, unlike selling cars from before. Selling cars is um, it's make believe money. It's you you show up Friday morning broke, and you've got a couple thousand dollars in your pocket that night, you know, or the next day. 
And so it just, it, it, it flowed like mud, like water through my hands. It's just, I mean, it's amazing how much money I made selling cars and how little of it, uh, little I had to show for it. I mean, nothing. How, how long did that, con- like, when, when did you kind of leave, when did you run away and, and how long did this, this part of your, your life story go on for? All right. So my dad died when I was real young and then I was six when he got murdered and I started acting out at school and I'm old enough that they were allowed to hit me back then. So I got, I got spanked in every class since third grade. Right. So I kind of had a, a low opinion of education facilities, uh, the system. So I started running away from that when I was 13, run away from home when I was 13, started just never went back. Right. Met some guy who gave me a beer, met some guy who gave me a joint, met some guy who, you know, yada, yada. Um, so that all that that started then when now i have the uh i have the uh um the joy of being also a high school dropout and a college dropout because when i got to high school it just it, it was clear that i didn't want to do this anymore so i just dropped out i went off to yosemite and we were camping there and i walked into their uh, office because i saw all these people in line i said what are you doing they said we're getting a job here i said well yosemite's gorgeous i want to live here so I got a job working in Yosemite and all of those, all the kids that they were hiring were uh, college students off for the summer. So they're coming over from Louisiana, from all over the world, actually. And so girl I met goes, you need to get back into school. You can't be a, a dropout, you know, right? Because these are all college students. I'm like, all right. So I went back to Sacramento, um, walked into the junior college there, right? All I got to do is take a test. And they said, okay, you're fine. I'm good at tests. Tests are my thing. Um, Going to class every day and doing the work, that's a different story. Um, So I took my test, I got in, and and right away it was was high school with cigarettes, essentially. It's the same people, same thing, same silliness, right? It wasn't serious, and so I just, so I dropped out of that. Um, But right after I dropped out of that, that's when I kind of needed some money. And that's when the car sales thing came in. Um, Walked into a Chevy dealership. How old were you? How old were you around this time? 20, 20, 21, something like that. Okay. So you're selling cars selling and making cars. just the most ridiculous money ever, which sounds a lot like waitressing when you said I would be broke oh, yeah. and walk in and walk out with, I didn't walk out with a couple of thousand dollars every night, but I could easily clear $200 on a Friday or Saturday night. And when I was waitressing, this was a hundred years ago. We're the same age, Chris. So um, I also got spanked in third grade because I didn't do my work either. Oh, yeah. We have some similarities in our background. So I think that it's very interesting that you said, I made all this money and I have nothing to show for it. I have nothing to show for my waitressing years. And I could have had a lot to show for my waitressing years. I was living with my parents. You said that you ran away from home. When did you leave home permanently? It sounds like pretty young. Um, permanently... I'd say 16, 17, but there was a, there's a lot of yo-yo back and forth, right? I'd show up, you know, at my mom's door and say, Hey, I can't do this. And, you know, cause has, has an addict and every addict will tell you, they're always fighting to get free. You're always fighting to get free. Um, and you know it, you know what you're doing. Um, with, with, with the, you know, it's, it's the maintenance program. It's like when you, when you start getting, the first one you're getting high, the first few you're getting high, but then you're like trying to maintain after that. You're just trying to not go down to that low level when you're just down. So it's always a maintenance program. And eventually you can't, you can't con- control it. So then you crash, right? So then you can't go to work for a week. You can't do this. You can't do that. And so there's a lot of that yo-yo stuff, but permanently, yeah, 17, 18, I was out. I was gone. And where were you living or who were you living with? How did you support yourself? So the first time I ran away, I was sitting in a pizza joint, sleeping in their booth cause they, until they throw me out at 2 a.m. when they close. This is in San Jose. And a uh, girl from church drove by, recognized me, and grabbed me, put, threw me in the back seat of her car and took me home, put me in her, her sister was gone to college. So she stuck me in her bed. And then in the morning, she woke, woke me up and went down and uh, told her mom, I've got a new brother. So I stayed with them for six months and that really helped me um, 
get back into school a little bit because they had different expectations from me. And so, you know, that one was, that was a good time. So then eventually my parents moved to Sacramento and said, you, you need to come with us. You can't live with this other family forever. But okay. So I went home back with them. And then within, I don't know, within six months, I was back on the streets running around. So there's a lot of uh, couch surfing. There's a lot of uh, sleeping out in parks. You know, I know that the, I know to stay warm, a good place to sleep is in a recycle bin uh, underneath all the papers and all the all the newspapers. And uh, well, back then newspapers, now it's cardboard, right? It's, it's a good insulator. You just burrow in. Only problem with that is mice. You know, they like to snuggle up with you. But I mean, that was that was then that was a different life. So, so, you know, fast forward here in a couple of years, it sounds like, it sounds like there's a, a, a variety of, of ways that you're kind of living and, and going about things for this period. What, how old are you? And, what, and let's fast forward to that moment where you went back to Santa Cruz, it sounds like, um, and, and, and kind of began pivoting. All right. So, like I said, Tana, um, Tana saved me. She's my saving grace all the way around. And, um, uh, sorry, she, um, uh, We've got the, she's going to school there. She's going to uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz. And so we got there. I started working and, oh, working. This is, this is new. Okay. So I got a job at the Carpenters. I walked in my first day. I was holding motors up in the air with whole two arms. And when I got off work that first day, I was so sunburned and so tired. I couldn't walk all the way from the car to the house. I sat down in the driveway, just rested. Right. I'm, I'm new to work, actual work. Um, and so that's when that's when that came along. So I, I went through that program. We bopped around. Um, Santa Cruz was kind of expensive, even in the early two thousands. We we kind of knew that we weren't going to be buying a home because it was just something outside of our range. Before we get into that, what was your financial pos position at this point? I, 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 as I understand it, in some cases when you're kind of just getting back into things like this, there can be debts or other things that are associated. You know that that you've accrued over the years. Were you kind of broke or, or we, did you have a little bit of savings or did you have some debts or how, how did that look? So I had zero money, absolutely zero money. I did not realize how much debt I had. Um, I, it's, it's when, uh, in my mid twenties, I got married, I had, we had a, uh, a son and then I got divorced right away and she rightfully left and took my son with her, right? Our son. And I haven't seen him since. I have I had a lot of debt, a lot of child support, a lot of just car repos that had come along, things that popped up later. And I didn't realize how much it was until later on in our journey when we when uh, we discovered Dave Ramsey. And, you know, what happened was my grandpa died and left me a little bit of money, twelve thousand dollars, not enough to do anything with. But I also knew I didn't want to just flitter it away. So I was keeping my ear open for something to do with finances. What, what do you got? So then I ran into the Dave Ramsey on the radio. And, uh, and, uh, and so I, I listened to the podcast, I had my earphones in at work, and I'm kind of laughing at these suckers. I mean, they're calling in. Oh, my goodness. They, they were nutty. They were goofy. And then I said, how much debt do I have? And then I started thinking about it. I started thinking about the child support and the, all that back stuff. And then I added it up. And all of a sudden, my heart's pounding. I can't breathe. I'm standing on a ladder. I'm getting kind of dizzy. I'm like, oh my God, I have $144,000 in debt. Okay. Now that's our debt. Cause by now we're married. She's got a little bit of school loans for some reason. We, at some point in time. I, and this is awesome, but I just want to, I'm, I'm having trouble following the timeline here. This is, this is, you're, you're having this moment of debt discovery after you're working. After we're, and, married. And, mm -hmm. after we're married. So when, when we moved to Santa Cruz, I had nothing, Z $0 in my pocket. She was going to school, taking out some school loans. I had some back child support going on. I had some repos going on. We had credit card stuff going on. Um, and then we got married and uh, I kind of bopped around. I noticed this when I was a, when I was a bridge builder, um, the car, the, on the weekends, I'd have weekends off, but those electricians, they would leave and they would come back every Monday morning with like a thousand dollars cash because they were doing side work. And nobody was asking me to do side work. Nobody said, hey, Chris, I need you to come over to my house and help me build a bridge in my backyard. Nobody said that. And so I jumped, I jumped ship from the carpenters and I jumped over to the electricians and I went through that apprenticeship. So now the apprenticeships for the trades uh, don't cost you anything, right? That's, that's my saving grace right there too. It does not cost you to become an apprentice. You can walk into 
for in my case, I walked into the union hall for the carpenters, but for the electricians, the, the union was, they said they were full. So I said, okay, I went non-union. There's options out there and they pay you uh, whatever your wage is going to be. They said it, you know, uh, so your first year apprenticeship, I went from $33 an hour as a carpenter down to $13 an hour as a apprentice uh, electrician. That was kind of hard. Uh, so then I was doing other jobs too. I was doing, uh, I, was, I was serving uh, samples at Costco, trying to make money on the weekends just to keep it going. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're, you know, they have you sell that. I, I'm sorry. I, I just have a couple of things to get back to, get back to the pr the moment you're in time that you're at right now with, with, with your story. What year do you move to Santa Cruz? What year do I move to Santa Cruz? 2005. Five. Did you get that? Uh, Thanks, Tana. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay. So 2005 <laughs> is a big turning point for you. It sounds like. Big right? time. And big with time. This. And when, when, what year do you kind of have this Dave Ramsey moment where you discover how much debt you, you, you're in? Okay. So Dave Ramsey, 2014, because Ivan was just born. Okay. So, so there's a period of time here. There's a period of time here, but of nine years where your, your life is improving, but you're not, you're not getting ahead financially. It sounds like after you, you know, after you got married and that, that kind of stuff. Okay. So we got married. She graduated. We we moved from Santa Cruz back to Sacramento. I was, you know, making, like I said, 33 bucks an hour as a carpenter. And then uh, we did that change. She was a, what did you, she went, to, she went and got a job with the state, hated that she did. Uh, I got on with the electricians. They bought me around. I started building hospitals and then I ended up back in the Bay area. So 2000, what is that? 10, 12, we're um, back in the Bay area. She gets a job as a supervisor at Whole Foods, and and then we get pregnant. So, yeah, 2013, 2014 is when he was born, and um, and that was when my grandpa died, and we got that little bit, that little inheritance. Now, by this time, we were both making pretty good money, right? She's just, she's making money there. Plus, she was make, she was uh, working at the Whole Foods. So, have you ever shopped at Whole Foods? Well, with their discount, you can afford to. So that, that helped a lot. <laughs> Whole paycheck, you, right? Yeah, right. I've heard that joke. They give you 25% off. And so we we're able to eat well. Plus that was applied to um, anything, any sales that were on. And so she would know what was on sale. So we could do that. So it kind of saved us a lot of money on the food stuff. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then my grandpa died. But by then we, we went ahead and we felt pretty good about life. We, we bought a car. Right, a, a one-year-old car. So you know, okay, kind of a high payment. But it, and then I, I, uh, oh, I was driving my truck. I was looking out the window, staring at a hardware store, and chainsaws were on sale. And so I was staring at that, and I rear-ended some poor woman, and and just totaled my truck. So naturally, we had to go out because now we're making both pretty good money. We had to buy a brand new car. We bought a brand new Nissan Rogue, and uh, you know, with the payments that came along with that, and the depreciation that came along with that. So now we have a brand new vehicle. We have a one-year-old vehicle. We've got a bunch of credit cards that were going on. I got all my back old stuff. She's got her school loans. And that's when Dave Ramsey, you know, said his thing on the radio. And, you know, like I said, I was always listening for something new. Um, kept one earbud in and just listening to those those suckers who kept calling in with their $30,000 debts, you know, $40,000 debts. And I was just laughing at them and going, how could you do that? And then I added it up myself and said, how could I do that? And, you know, and I ran, I mean, ran full speed at the debt too, didn't I? Yeah, that that's awesome. Th thank you for setting the stage with that. So we're at 2014. We've got, we, we're, we, we, you've discovered Dave Ramsey and, and this concept of, of how much debt you have. You have this pit in your stomach. What changes about your financial behavior from that point forward? Like, how do you, how do you begin approaching it? You, you mentioned you, you want the side work, but you know, are you starting to be more conscious with spending? What do you do with the 12,000? How, how do things change from that, that moment in time? Okay. So exactly what Dave Ramsey says, don't do, I did do. I ran home and said, we're getting out of debt. We're selling everything. Da, 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 da. And she's like, no, 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 no. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> so we, yeah, we had to talk that through. Now that 12,000 was so helpful because we were able to, uh, we put the cars up for sale. I sold the, the Hyundai, uh, to a guy in town there. Um, at this point we're living in Santa Rosa or Willits actually north of Santa Rosa. I sold the 
to a guy there in town, the, the, the brand new rogue, we couldn't get rid of it. Not, not one interest, right? We put it on Craigslist. We put it on all the things, nobody. So we took it down to CarMax and they said, well, this is what we'll give you for it. And luckily I had that money. So we were able to pay the difference, right? Which is $2,500. So I paid $2,500 to sell that car. Because because your lo- your debt on the car was bigger was yes you, you, we were upside down twenty thousand in debt on a seventeen five car or whatever it was there you go almost exactly the numbers too, um, so we did that now so now our our twelve is down to under ten, uh, we take that we go when we bought a hundred and sixty five thousand mile Acura MDX, which we still have, it's got two hundred and seventy thousand miles on it now. But it's a Honda. It's an Acura, right? We just change the oil, keep it going, right? Every time something breaks, we think, is it time? Is this is this the one? Is this the one? Well, you know, it's only 800 bucks. 800 bucks, okay, no payment, okay. So <laughs> that's that's one of the changes we've made. We sold those. So now we're down to one car. And how much did that change your payments by? Oh, goodness. That set of actions. 700 bucks. I think I think the car was $300.00. Right around there, and four fifty or so for the uh, Rogue plus insurance, because you got to have full coverage insurance on all that stuff. You don't need full coverage insurance on a two hundred thousand mile car. You know that? That saves you a little bit. That saves you a penny or two. Yeah, you're easily saving seventy five hundred bucks, seventy seventy seven hundred and fifty bucks a month after making these decisions, and you you made the investment to pay twenty five hundred, which is only like what, like a three four month payback to to uh, uh, to sell. The, one of those cars, get rid of that payment and get a cheaper one. That's outstanding. Yeah, the twenty five hundred was to get rid of the car. Now the MDX costs us six thousand, maybe five thousand, five or six thousand, right? But worth every penny, right? Because now we have no payments. We closed off the the credit cards. We um did, we did his whole snowball thing, right? Started lowest to largest, and uh, and just started paying things off. And we kept that one thousand dollars in reserve. You know, like the like Dr says. And, uh, and we're, I mean, I'm volunteering for all overtime by the time also, because when the baby came along, um, she quit her job because we discussed, you know, what, 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 what does that look like? You know, do we want to pay someone else to raise our child? No, I want to stay home and be a mom. Great. You know, I, I want that. I want you to stay home, you know, and with our child and get that good bond so that, you know, later on in life, we don't say, oh, where did the nanny go wrong? You know, now we got, you know, we can blame ourselves. Right. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, so, so walk me through, and, and I want to just kind of keep learning more about this turning point in your financial journey, because you're, you, it's 2000. Do you remember when in 2014 this was to get me even more specific mid middle of the year, early part of the spring, year? Spring, spring. Okay. So spring 2014, where you're making these changes, how long does it take you to make the moves with the cars, for example? Over the next month. Right. Once we decided. So you moved just, really quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm an addict. I'm all in on everything. And how did things, how did you, how, how are other areas of your spending impacted in addition to the cars? Other areas of our spending. Okay. So, well, that's one of the things. So we, you quit going out to eat, right? Which we did a lot. So that, that went away right away. We just, we quit vacationing for a month there. Um, we used to go camping all the time. You know, they're always renting a house here for, you know, the weekend or whatever. Uh, we had, we didn't do that anymore. That stopped right away. Uh, no more, I'm, I'm no more anything. We just shut it down. Now, um, DR talks about gazelle intensity. I didn't get that. Right? I, I, I was more of a put my head down and plot through it, right? I didn't get that intensity that they talked about when they say when you're building up until I got out of debt, right? And that took... Four years. It took four years to get completely out of debt. Okay. How do you stay the course during this four years of payoff where you're not going camping and you're not doing anything fun and you're not going out to eat and you're not, not, not? How do you stay on track? Uh, where we were living up there when we made the decision, we were in a in an old hunting cabin that somebody converted and we rented that. And we're just surrounded by trees out in Willits, right? You couldn't even see the next house. It was gorgeous. And so we just, we didn't have cable. Um, we didn't have any of that stuff. We just kind of sat outside and read, you know, we read books and just talk. And we had a newborn. So there's that, right? Yeah, I guess that's a little bit of work there. Yeah. And it's also <laughs> a lot of planning on what, what we want to pass on to him, right? 
Because the day he was born, I was, you know, oh, the day he was born, they give you those those uh, masks you got to wear in, inside the surgery room, and they're made of paper. And so I'm crying, thinking nobody can see me. Well, it hit that blue paper and exploded, right? And I don't know this until I leave the room, and they're like talking about it, you know, talking about it. And she's laughing. She's like, oh, they, you know, they can see you crying on that. I, I did not know that. But I'm holding this baby. I'm holding this child, and I'm saying, you know, I'm like, I'm going to teach him everything I know about electricity. And she and Tana's. He doesn't have to be an electrician if he doesn't want to. I said, no, no. But he's going to walk out the door when he's an adult with the ability to make a hundred grand a year. That's my gift to him because we're older, right? I'm at this time when he was born, we we're 42, you know, I'm planning, I'm thinking through my head, what am I going to do? I'm a geriatric dad. He's going to want to say, let's go play ball one day and I'm going to have to get my walker. No, hold on. Let me catch up to you, son. <laughs> So that's my gift to him because at this point we we don't have anything right we're 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 just starting our getting out of debt you know that that big numbers ahead of us um, so that's I can't you know I'm not building a college fund for him um, I'm gonna give him the tools to make however much he can make and work his way through school which turns out to be pretty good thing because I you know there's that those are different podcasts and different books right kids who work through school that their GPA tends to be a little bit higher their time management skills tend to be a little bit better. And these are, these are the things that I'm hopefully, you know, hopefully instilling him a child if he decides to go to college. Now, he's six now. And if you ask him what he wants to do, he wants to be a worker like dad, which makes my heart grow three times every time he says it, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that kind of helps, you know, just knowing that we're moving forward. Now, with volunteering for the overtime that I do, I work a lot, so there that that kept me out of trouble, right? I go to go to work with an empty wallet, so I don't spend any money at lunch. With all this context that you just shared, can you just walk us through one more time? You were building bridges, but you couldn't, and that was your skill set in 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 the sense of, in the world of carpentry, right? Um, you're a carpenter who worked on bridges, is a special a speciality, and that made thirty three bucks an hour, some or de pretty decent money. But you said, "I want to earn more." on the side. And so you dropped to an apprenticeship program and then we're able to go from there. Can you, can you walk us through that journey again? So in California, the apprenticeship program is called WECA, uh, Western Electrical Contractors Association. And I walked in there and uh, they, you know, you gotta have a, a high school, you gotta have a high school diploma. So I had to go back to get that test that I took and get that and run it over there, show them, prove to them that I, I could do it and take the test that they give you. Now, here's an interesting thing. They give you an, a, a sample test of the trigonometry on their website. And so I went through with one tab open, looking at the questions, another tab open, looking for the answers, trying to figure out the formulas. Okay, or, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen this. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Pythagorean theorem. Okay, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing the triangles. And we, we got the hypotenuse. I got it. Okay, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. So I go inside and I take the test and I sit down. And the test was the practice test, it, verbatim. Right, not not one letter changed, and I'm, I'm I'm looking at these, and so by the time I get done with the test, I'm not even looking at the questions. I'm just looking at the answers. That's the answer, right? That, that's the answer. And then you know, I went back and double checked it. Sure, right? Just aced it, got 100 percent on that one, and so that that's <laughs> what got me in there. Now they have a they have a set schedule for how much you make, and so they thirteen dollars for the first year, thirteen and a half, then it's like sixteen and something, and then it's you know nineteen, and then it's twenty two, and then you top out it. Or something like that up to the fifth year so that you know that first year was hard the 13 was hard but Hannah was working she'd gotten out of school we'd moved to Sacramento and what year is that is that 2014 that you're making the 13 nine 2009 I think okay okay so you you sorry th so this this income change happened prior to your dedication to paying off debt and getting yes. Getting, so okay. the debt came along, the, uh, Dave Ramsey came along in 2014. So by that time, so 2010, 2014, so by that time I was a fifth year. So I was making $25 an hour and it was a lot, a lot more doable at that rate. Right. Plus since we cut back so much, um, it was all right. It was, it, like I said, doable, you know? Um, yeah. When we moved, when we finally left and the baby was born and that, that cut our, uh, our income, we, the, uh, the hospital I was working on, the guy lived in Nevada, the foreman, he lived in Nevada. And he said, I need you to come with me up here and, uh, and, uh, help me build this hotel. And I said, Nevada, 
are you kidding? Nevada's brown. They don't have any trees there. I'm not moving to Nevada because we were living out in the woods. I mean, we're literally there was it, sunshine was a was a commodity there. If you cut down a tree and had some sun in your yard, people were like would come over and stand in it because it was just you know it's just such shade everywhere. And so now I'm I'm out. He goes, come out here. You'll love it. Just shut up. So we, I came out here, and the hotel he's building was up here at South Lake Tahoe, literally 200 oh. yards from where I'm at right now, uh, here at the Hard Rock Cafe. And uh, and so we moved to Nevada, and it took a lot to convince Tana, because Tana's, we've never lived, when all the bopping around we did, we've never lived more than an hour from the saltwater, right? We li- When we lived in Willits, we were 30 minutes from... Uh, uh, Fort Bragg. We, we lived in Santa Cruz. We could hear the breakers at night when we went to sleep over there on Clinton Street. You know, we were near the ocean. She loves the ocean, right? That's one of her things is when she get off work, she could go sit and listen to it. She lo- likes the tide pools, and all, uh, the tide pools. And then I brought her up here to the desert. And uh, the only way to convince her was to bring her 20 minutes from our front door. Your toes are in this, what's essentially an inland sea that is Lake Tahoe, right? This big giant bottle of water. And she goes, okay. I'm willing to go if we can live that close to Tahoe, right? And there's trees too. That whole area is surrounded by trees for those of you who haven't. You know exactly when you when you leave California because the trees stop. And I think that's what they did <laughs> when they were first mapping it out. Like, this is, well, there's the last tree. Okay, that's the edge of California. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that's awesome. So, so in 2014, you're making $24 an hour. Is that right? Yeah, 20, I can't remember what year I was as in the apprenticeship. I think I was in my last year of apprenticeship. So it was 24, 25, somewhere around there. And at this point, are you able to start getting that extra work or the overtime, the the side gigs and those types of things as well? Okay, so once we left there and we came up here, a couple of things happened. One is we left California and all of a sudden my income got an 11% increase because I wasn't paying California income tax. So that was a boost. Two, we were not living in the Bay Area. So suddenly our apartment that we rented here, right, two bedroom, two bath, was only 875 or 850 something like that. I mean, it was ridiculously cheap. And so that helped. And then once I got up here, this hotel from day one uh, was overtime, lots and lots of overtime. And periodically throughout that, I would get side work, right? Someone wants you to hang a fan or, you know, fix a switch. So I was doing that off and on, and I didn't start doing that heavy until three years ago. Now, three years ago, four years ago, we got out of debt, right? We paid off that last debt. Oh, here's a fun thing. The the apprenticeship that I went through, they go ahead and they start a retirement fund for you. Okay, so, and I didn't know this. And what then they just kind of did it. And then when you get to the, they keep it to the side, keep it to the side. And then when you get to the end and you graduate out, they present you with, okay, you have this, what do you want to do with it? And most guys cut a check, right? They keep 20% for the taxes and they cut a check and most, yeah, grimace. Most guys go buy a truck and, you know, or whatever. And that's that. Since I had been working so much overtime and been volunteering for so many jobs and was willing to travel out of town for anything that they had, instead of having a, instead of a $30,000 on average check is what most guys got, I had $67,000. Uh, and so right away, I knew I didn't want to mess with that. So I rolled it into uh, an IRA, right? So now, boom, right? This is beautiful. I've got $67,000. We paid off a bunch of the little ones. Um, we're, we're working on, I don't remember which step we were on or which one of the debts we're on, but I do have a child support debt looming, right? It's there. And I know it. And I'm going to have to pay this. This is, you know, child support, when you get behind on it, they charge you 10% interest and so the the i was behind over the years twenty seven thousand, and with the with the um interest over that whole time it went up to sixty something thousand dollars so the minute i rolled that money into an ira it triggered the the tax the liens and it, and it went to her and it as it should and it went to him right and then hopefully because right about this time he's 17 18 years old and um Hopefully this is going to be his college money, right? Like I said, at the time when, when we had that baby, I was not a good person. I was not a good father. I was not a good husband. And she was right to take him away. And I, and I understand that and I accept that. But hopefully that money came in, came in at the right time for him, okay? So that helped with the debt a lot. 
And that was your last and biggest debt. Is that right? Yeah, but it it came out of sequence because it, it we weren't ready for it. So then after that, we started working on her school loans. Now, here's something funny. Uh, the first school loan that we paid off was $1,200. And we sent it in. And she said, uh, she said, you know, that's exactly the amount of money I borrowed 10 years ago. And she's been paying every month on it since. All right. So when we finally, yeah, when we finally paid it off, interest only for 10 years, right? What What's still there? Well, the whole principal. Yeah. So then we started chunking money at that. And then by that time, I'm up here. We're up here in Nevada. We're, up, we're living in Minden, uh, just south of Carson City, 20 minutes from South Lake Tahoe. And I'm doing side work. And I'm a lead guy. I'm running crews. I put into my boss, uh, I say, I think I need to get into foreman training because I'm ready for it. And he goes, absolutely. And so they dangled the carrot. They said, oh, we got you on, on, on foreman on a foreman's list. Next time it comes available, we'll talk to you, right? There's my carrot. And I was like, no, because I'm doing foreman work. I'm making orders. I'm running guys. I'm running crews. And really all I wanted was a truck. I wanted the truck that they give you, right? I don't want, I don't want to pay for gas anymore. And, uh, and they dangled that. And I get a call from, uh, from a guy that I worked with, you know, for a few years. And he goes, Hey, I need you to come over here and take a look at this company. They, they need you in their service department. I said, service. What do I know from service? I'm a commercial electrician. I've been building hospitals. I've been building hotels, right? I, you know, what do I know from service? I'm going to go into somebody's house. He goes, yeah, it's all right. It'll be fine. And so, uh, I go over and apply. Now this company was, was union. So I had to, I had to join the union, um, which was fine. You know, I'm not pro union. I'm not opposed to the union. Cause here's what I know from working in both. You've got good guys who want to do good and you got guys who suck and can't do good. And they're both right. They're either, you know, so the whole union thing is, you know, when, uh, but a lot of people buy into it and say, oh, because you're a union uh, electrician, you're better. Mm, I'm exactly the same as I was when I wasn't. So I went into service over there. And then the moment I got into service, they were really against overtime. No more overtime. No, 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 no. We don't want to do overtime, right? We, we want to keep our costs down. At the end of the day, you're done. Okay. Well, I had to make that up. So I started doing a lot of side work and, and I put it out on Facebook. I said, hey, I'm a electrician. I'm kind of bored. Does anybody need anything done? Boom. Oh my goodness. It blew up. It went from me making a few hundred dollars here and there, right? You know, to thousands of dollars. And I said, Oh, the IRS is going to catch one of this. So I went down and got my license, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't want the Gestapo coming after me. And so I got my license. I got, went ahead and got my business name and uh, God bless. I got some t-shirts made. And so C2 electrical was born and that, that one post kept me busy for six months. And, and this is, this is 2016, 17, 18. What, what, what year is this? 17, rounding? 18. And, and you're rounding out the last of your debts. You're, you're paying off your last kind of very large debts after this, after applying the snowball for three years. Is that right? I'd say, I'd say we were snowballing for four years and then 18, we paid off the last one and we kind of took a breath there. Um, and just kind of relax for a second. It was it was fun. But then the moment I I put that post out there on Facebook and so this is right after this is right after your your achievement of paying off all the debt. Let, let's go back go back to that for one second. How'd that feel to pay off that last debt? Oh, that was cool. That was cool. That was amazing. That was you know he, he talks about how uh, you you a great weight is lifted. It it was. I mean, my shoulders just kind of slumped down. Was, the tension I didn't know I was carrying it was just kind of relaxed out of me. Um, it was cool. I mean, it just, but by this time we're also committed to, um, the way we're living, right? We don't, it, it just, it's normal now, you know, um, somewhere along the line. Well, okay. When you, when you quit doing drugs, there's something that happens to you physically. And a lot of guys get really fat and I did. So I'm now, uh, I went up to like 325. And so, um, being the guy that I am, I sat down and said, what is the science of a fat burning? What, what, what kills a fat cell? And so I looked it up and then I fell into keto, right? So the, the ketosis is the byproduct of a fat, of a lipid, you know, triglyceride breaking down and the lip is burning through your system. And that's, that's the byproduct of, of it. So we fell into keto. So then we started doing keto. I started a, a blog then. I did that for a while and I was just doing all this. And now with this difference in our food and the way we're eating, I know this is not finance, but it is finance. Um, we now have to, we're looking at all the labels, right? Everything has sugar in it. 
everything's got sugar in it. I'm borderline type two at this point. Um, and uh, type two diabetic, we're borderline. I wasn't quite there, but it's pre-diabetic. And so we're, we're reading everything. So now we're, we're, we can't buy all the things that we were buying. So we have to change what we, what our intake is. So now we do basically just the perimeter of the grocery store is the foods that we're buying, like the vegetables and the over here on this side, the meats over here on this side, the cheeses back here on this side, and then we're out because everything else has got sugar dumped into it. And so we're trying to get away from a lot of the carb loading that we were doing. And I lost a hundred pounds, over a hundred pounds. Okay, so, so same question. I always come back to this, but but when when did you kind of get to three twenty five, and ha- what timeline did it look like when you dropped all this hundred pounds? So I don't know, three twenty five, probably eight years ago, six years ago, and then I burned down. I burnt. I lost some weight. I got it down to two fifty, two sixty five, something like that. And that's when I, you know, I was always fat, and uh, and now I'm still jiggly. But I'm not fat. Like I, my pants are, my pants are 33. I went from. I think 40 you look great. To... <laughs> my, my, I jiggle when I jump. That's what I tell people. Um, <laughs> my my pants are down to a 33, and that's something I had in high school, and that was amazing. I couldn't believe it. So that's when I started that blog, and I was writing and taking pictures and just you know documenting my journey. This was 2000, and when I started the blog was 2017. We're getting a highlight reel here of just incredible transformational changes that you're making over, over long periods of time. These are right. And, and, and so we're, we're not like, this is not a, uh, an event sequence here. This is a, this is a continuum. It sounds like where there are defining moments and events where you figure out like, Oh, here's how to burn fat and here's how to get out of debt and those types of things. And it, but then there's years long slogs that you're basically going all out. Um, you say you're, you're saying, Oh, I didn't do gazelle intensity. Um, yeah, you did. <laughs> for four years, you kind of, you, you kind of did for for a lot of this stuff to grind it out. In, in my opinion, right? I mean, you're like this sounds like an intense journey on the finance and the and the weight loss front. Is that right? Yeah. So th- there was also um, finding faith in there too, because when when Tana mm-hmm. um, when Tana came along and showed me value in me, uh, I started looking for existential things then, right? And that's when we we found uh, I found my faith. Right? Started going to church. We started that whole thing. So everything I do, I do entirely. So I jumped into the apologetics, listening to the arguments for and against God and this and that. And, you know, um, so I learned all that. So every every aspect of the way, there's a big change. I jump in all the way, right? So I jump into faith all the way. I jump into the debt all the way. I jump into the, the diet all the way, right? Trying to understand what my health is, trying to understand what that was. The intensity, the, the gazelle intensity really came along when we paid off that last debt, right? And I put out that that post. And all of a sudden, there's hundreds of people who just, you know, need this, need that. And so uh, that's when I really turned it on. So I haven't had a day off or two days off in a row in the last year and a half, right? Until now, right? I took yesterday off. I took today off. And tomorrow, I'm going to go do a panel change on my house, on my house, the house I bought. I'm doing a panel change. Um, That's when the intensity really kicked in. So now I'm making really good money because with each step up and and changing the job right um like the union out here that is forty dollars an hour when i was doing the service work and then uh a guy called me and said i want you to come work for my company i go you're not union can you compete with the, the money he goes absolutely i can i'll give you two dollars more I go, if you keep it two dollars more than there your hikes i'm good so i went over there now he caught on to the fact that i like to work I, that i started my own company now this is last summer and i'm working crazy i get off work i immediately go home drop off my van grab my tools my hand tools throw them in my truck oh i had to buy a truck um i had to throw them in my truck which has got a two hundred and fifty thousand miles on it i don't know if you kept kept track but, but the mileage of my truck and her her vehicle is enough to get you to the moon and back there, there are lunar vehicles <laughs> um nice so yeah i come home i jump in my truck i drive i go i work for four hours at night right so there's 12 hour day. And then, you know, if I'm lucky on the weekends, I can get 10, 12 hours, 14 hours a day then. Right. And I'm doing remodels. I'm doing everything. And we're just all the money for that business. My side business went into a business account. Doesn't get touched. We're living on my 40 hour, 40 hour W2. Right. So the 1099 money just sits in the account. Don't touch it. The only thing, the only thing that comes out of that account is when I go buy pro, uh, materials for the next job that I'm working on. Right. So, by default, it's a profit and loss statement, my bank statement every month, right? 
because the only thing that comes out is expenses for the business. And the only thing that goes in is profits from the work. And, and then at one point in time, I, I put out a second post on Facebook and that's all I've ever done. And it's just word of mouth there. I've got like, I've got a group of people that if somebody says, is there an electrician in our area? There's like 10 people who just, here's his number, call them. Right. And that just keeps me flowing and I just keep working. And even when I want to take like a little bit of time off, I just, the calls are coming in, the texts, you know, the, the messaging on, uh, on the messenger there. Um, that's when the intensity really kicked in this last year. Cause now I have a goal. I meet, uh, I meet a girl. She's, uh, she's got some property. She's an income investor. And, uh, I'm talking to her about saving a house. Cause my goal then was to buy a house and just chunk money on it. Yeah. I wanted to get into that, but I wanted to, to transition this from the, the, you pay off the debt. You're feeling great about it. What's, 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 what is, how does things evolve from there? So we can get set up for the, the house and the, and the income investing. So, okay. That's where, that's where, uh, that's where she comes in. Um, she's a, she's a real go-getter. She takes care of her, her stuff, right? She goes in and like a lot of people, I can, I can change that outlet. I can change that switch and three-way switching is a little bit more difficult than a normal switching. Cause there's different wires involved and da, da, da. And so she miswired it. And so I get called in to, to fix this little bit of a problem. Her carpenter that was there that day asked me if I did side work. I said, sure, I do side work. You know, he tells her, she calls me uh, on my personal phone and, and uh, she said, I have some investment properties I want you to take a look at. I said, okay. All right. And so then I go and take a look and, and then while doing this work for her, um, she lays it down that Brandon, it, it should be her husband because she loves bigger pockets, right? He doesn't know it, but Brandon should be my husband, right? And, uh, and. <laughs> Right. And so, and she's awesome. And so uh, I start talking to her and then start listening to it. So, okay. I'm always listening for something new. And this is, this is 2018 or 2019? Last year. This is the beginning of last year. And uh, it was, it was the end of 2019. Before we get to this moment, you're paid off all your debt. Are you then approaching the third baby step, which I think is the emergency reserve? Yeah. Uh, six months emergency reserve? Yes. 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 So, okay. So we're saved, we saved that up. Right. By that time. Mm -hmm. And, and by the time I met her, the, um, the, I think our, our, our emergency fund was in place. We were, pr we were pretty well stabilized at that point. Right. So we, you were in perfect position to begin investing, but hadn't really accumulated a lot of cash yet to begin investing with. Yep. So that's when okay. we made that plan. That's okay. a perfect time to meet an investor. Yes. Right. And she's awesome. Like I said, so I'm always keeping my ear open for something new. She mentioned bigger pockets. So I go ahead and start listening to, you know, to those guys, right? Dave and Brandon and, uh, okay. All right. You know, so the, the idea evolves away from Dave Ramsey, right? In my personal life, I'm a hundred percent with the guy, right? I will not carry any debt at this time. This is what I'm thinking. I will not carry any debt. I'm just gonna, you know, okay. But when it comes to buying a house, okay, we're going to do something a little different, but I'm still a little, um, uh, I'm still wary, right? Because it was a it was a hard lesson to learn, right? With that 144 thousand, so we decided, okay, let's do the whole save up a bigger down payment, right? Um, we got so this is over the over the next year. It brings us up to the end of the year. We're we're close to 12 percent down. If we can find a house for, oh, I'm thinking uh, I'm good. At, we'll get 50 for 50 grand down, right? I'm good. And, you know, 12 percent houses start shooting up. As we all know, right now it's it's nuts, and so we we had um, put an offer in on a house, gone. We weren't even close. Right? They told us, "Oh yeah, yeah, you were like the lowest offer," and we were five grand over. We offered five grand over what they're asking. We were the lowest offer. Like, oh my lord! So the next one we offered ten over, and finally we, we found this one. We, I, you know, I didn't even look at the house. Tana went and saw it. She said it's a perfect house for a rental because by this time, I'm saying out loud while I'm driving, and I talk out loud while I'm driving a lot. Right? I'm saying. I want to be at an investor. I want to own real estate because I'm looking at uh, at our, our, you know, what our retirement's going to look like. You know, we're fairly well broke, but I, I had been investing, right? So I had a 401k at, at the old company that I rolled into an IRA. I had um, started the Roth IRA, so we're putting in, you know, a thousand dollars a month, five hundred for me, five hundred for my wife. Um, now I'm doing the, a new uh, 401k with the work now. Um, but so that's all, that's all growing and it's nice and it's, but it's small, you know, and there's 
like I said, we're we're a little older, so we're getting started late in life. So I need to do something more, something bigger. And that's when my shift in my mind happened with, uh, uh, why don't we buy something that will cash flow readily, right? So if we're looking at 20% down on a house, that should, right, in most markets, be a cash flowing house and allow someone else to pay down that mortgage while we go to the next one and do the same thing again, right? We need help if we're going to get to a retirement where, you know, we're not dependent on, on you know, the accounts that are going to be small. So that, that all happened, yeah, over a little over a year ago. So we're, I'm doing the work with, the, with the, my company, C2. We're piling up the money. I'm working like crazy. And it's intense. It's intense. It's 12, 14-hour days every single day. And then we put in this offer, and we offered $350,026. And the, and the appraisal came in at $350,000. So we, we paid what it appraised for. And I'm okay with that because this house has a brand new roof. It has brand new windows, has brand new floors. It has a brand new furnace, right? Every, all the appliances are brand new. It, the only thing that's wrong with this house is it's got very bad electrical. Hello, let me have it, right? I'll take that. I'll take that. So that's what I'm doing tomorrow is changing that fuse box off of the building. Um, we had, you, as you know, you, you have to get homeowner's insurance before you can, you know, buy the house. You get, get it in place. They, the mortgage company wants to see that. We did, went ahead and did that. We, they, they have you take pictures of everything and send it to them because COVID, they're, they're not going to come out. So we sent pictures and, and we got a, a notice in the mail saying that they're canceling the insurance because of the fuse box because it doesn't have breakers. This house is made in 1961. And so we, you know, we call them and say, hey, uh, we've already got the permit pulled. We're, we're, you know, we got to, I'm getting the materials together. They said, it doesn't matter. You have until May 11th. So I've got two more weeks get that thing changed. So I'm going to change it tomorrow. And, and I'm so excited because I get to tear open the walls and run all new wires to this entire house, right? This is my job. I'm going to, I'm going to do a $10,000 upgrade to this house basically for a weekend's work on, you know, cause I know what I'm doing and it's awesome. It's, you know, the, the change from where I was back when all I had was my mouth gibbering to make money. And then I'd run off and, and fit it away and drugs and God only knows what else till this point now where I'm crawling under people's houses, I'm crawling in attics, I'm, I'm providing a service, a real service to them, right? I'm, I'm bringing value to other people that they're, they're afraid to do or can't do, don't know themselves. And th this is another big step and point in my life too, because now a lot of the peace that I found is in service to other people, right? And when I come, when I, when I come to somebody's house and I'm able to you know, do something that they're afraid of, right? It's awesome. And it pays well. Right. When I when I when I, I quit taking so much from everything and started doing more to give back, it paid. It paid. It, it I I get so much more personally than I ever did when I was out trying to get it. Right. There's there, we have we have the little money the little old lady money. So whenever a uh, a little old lady called me, she says I need you to hang a chandelier for me. Okay. So I go over there. Now I don't charge like. The widow, the widow woman, I want, I'm not going to charge her any money, but she's going to pay me something because she wants to, right? And I don't say what it is. I just, I'll take whatever it is. I'm happy. Thank you. You know, because she wants to, she wants to pay for what, the services she got. So if I go hang on a chandelier, she, she, you know, gives me 50 bucks. Okay, great. You know, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but I never, I never tell them, you know, what my wages are. And it's always, they always give me less and that's fine. So we just kind of keep that cash, right? And that's actually what we're, we're spending right now is the cash that we get from those little, little old lady jobs. Because they have a, like the first lady, she has a walking group. She tells one of the other ladies in her group. So she calls me over. Can you do the same thing for me? Yes. Oh, you hang a chandelier? Uh-huh. Uh, she gave you $50? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Can I give you $50? Oh, yes, you can. Right. You know, so there's like this small group of ladies that I just kind of just do work for. And they just give me little bits of cash and it kind of builds up. And that's really nice, right? It's, it's awesome. It's good feeling, you know, just hanging a chandelier. And mostly they just want to talk too. There's that, right? You know, my husband died seven years ago. You know, let's talk. Okay, let's talk, right? And I have a great time. I'll spend two, three hours just hanging a light, right? Just to do that sort of thing. But then when they when they pass on my name to, you know, their neighbor, right? This guy wants a spa put in. Okay, let me come over there. I get in there. I, I you know, I jump in the attic. I crawl across. I do my stuff. And people are just really appreciative. And it, it, it's a great feeling to be able to, to get back to that and that aspect. 
this, this is just just incredible. I mean, your 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 story and where you are right now, um, it's just amazing how how much income you're bringing in, how much wealth you're building. You said you're you're bringing in you know, how much you're helping people, how much your life seems to have improved um, with all that kind of stuff. You you your the emotion that you've you've brought into this and how how clearly like. It's just amazing to see you react. Hey, my son now wants to be like me growing up with with all that kind of stuff because of the, the great work you're doing. I mean, thank you for for sharing all of this with us, and congratulations, and just the enormous amount of success you've you've had, and 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 where you've gotten with all this. Scott, did you hear how excited he got when he started talking about being an electrician? You know, he's <laughs> mm-hmm. he's telling his story and it's going along. And then he talks about being an electrician and he's so excited. I want to highlight that for a minute because I feel a little bit uniquely qualified to discuss this. My father-in-law was an electrician. We do our own electrical work because y'all don't answer your phone. I cannot tell you how many times we have called contractors and you guys just let it ring. It goes to voicemail. I leave a voicemail. You don't call me back. Uh, La, 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 la. So we just finally ended up doing it ourselves. That's how we got started doing it ourselves was we called a plumber. He's like, yeah, I'll be there on Saturday. Saturday comes, no plumber. But we still have this big old cesspool underneath the crawl space that isn't going away and we need to fix it. I think the tub was like directly... uh, depositing right under the house. It was awesome. So my husband went down there and figured it out. Without YouTube, it was all with books and stuff. But what you're saying is, I heard you in the beginning of the show say, I didn't like school. I acted out in school for various other reasons, but school was not a place that you enjoyed. When we were in school, when we were in middle school, well, you got to do good in high school so you can get into college. You were going to go to college. That was how it went. You got up in the morning, you got dressed, you brushed your teeth. And when you graduated high school, you went to college. There was no other option. They didn't talk about trade school. We didn't talk about anything. So for you to go to college because the people at Yosemite are telling you to go to college, did you enjoy that at all? Like it was exact. I went to junior college too. It absolutely is high school with cigarettes. Yeah. So um, I had the same pressure. Um, my mom got remarried. I have a stepdad. He's my dad now. He's he's straight up my dad. And he used to always say, uh, if you don't go to college, you're going to end up digging ditches. And I think about those words every time I'm digging a ditch. And uh, and I smile because I'm only digging it. I'm only digging a ditch from here to there and I'm done. Right. But it's also <laughs> paying me 60 bucks an hour. You know, it's, you know, this ditch, this ditch brought me 400 bucks. Um, he was a programmer, <laughs> you know, so his, his mentality towards education was a little different. I call him trenches. Trenches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> That's good. Uh, You're in the yeah. trenches. Yeah. yeah. That's so, but well, I mean, that's then every, every once in a while I'll still dig. Um, but usually at this point I say, I'm too old. I'm not digging anymore. You know, I'm, I'm the knowledge that I have now is, is better used to put into running your wires and getting everything done right. And we'll, you know, we'll find a kid with a strong back who can dig us a ditch now. But yeah, when, uh, when I was, when I was growing up, you know, acting out in school, I was always the kid that they took and put him up and put my desk up next to the teacher's desk, facing the wall away from everybody else. And so that's when I stole the, uh, I swiped the Bilbo Baggins off of her desk, my teacher's desk in third grade and started reading. Cause I, you know, I'm not paying attention to anything anyway. So, so I started reading the, the Hobbit, right, in third grade. And, oh, that, that ignited books, right? And I have read voraciously ever since. There's never there's never been a time that I wasn't reading. And when I was in high school, I would uh, go, I would skip class and go hang out in the library and just read books. And for whatever reason, I was stealing them too. And then I'd bring them back because they would only let you check out three at a time. And I'm, I'm not doing that. I took seven and I'd stuff them in my backpack and I'd go home and I'd read all weekend long, right? And I'd bring them back and I'd, I'd put them back on the shelf when they didn't know. And so that just, but it was always fiction. It was never anything, it was never anything that improved my life. It just improved my lexicon. Like I, <laughs> that's the only thing I got out of that. But uh, I had an imagination. Now I'm reading all of these nonfiction books. Well, I'm not reading anymore. Now I'm listening to them, right? When I, I pop in audio books, because I'm always driving, I'm always working. Um, my education is books now right it's it's it always has been it's everything i've learned i've learned from listening to this listening to that go and trying it uh go try fail 
that's how you succeed, right? Go try, fail, go try, fail, and then boom, suddenly you succeed. And a lot of that's just from the education, from learning from the books and the reading and all that. So like I said, I what I expect from my son is going to be a little different than what was expected of me, but it's exactly what you said, Minnie, that it, school was expected of you, right? So I don't know. When I got there, it was just such a, such a letdown. How, um, how could, would, do you, do you mind if, would you mind sharing a little bit about, you know, how much you're saving per month nowadays and, and maybe like a, a, like a ballpark of where your net worth is sitting today? Okay. So my, my wage is $42 an hour, right? Which at 40 hours a week puts you out right around 85,000 a year. Okay. Um, my boss I started a new company last summer, last September, and he caught on quick the fact that I like to work. So he's always throwing overtime at me. So that pushed last year's W-2 income uh, up to 95. And then on the side, uh, on my C-2, I think we paid taxes on 35 on that. So that pushed us up to uh, uh, right around $130,000 for the year, uh, which was good. That's awesome. Great, yeah. Especially since that 35 was um, not touched and just belt. Now, like I said, I'm always keeping my ear out for stuff. Uh, last year, oh, we shut off the cable a long time ago, right? To save money. So I don't have a lot of media input. So I'm immune to a lot of things that uh, is it, that gets other people wild up. So I didn't know about COVID for a long time. I just noticed that there wasn't any cars on the road when I'm driving to work, right? And then I'm asking, what's going on? They're like, oh, there's a lockdown. Oh, there's a lockdown. Okay. You know, there's a disease floating around. Oh, that's terrible. Right. And I just kept working and it never really bothered me, but I, I started thinking, look at all those cars at the airport, man, the, the enterprise cars, there's a sea of enterprise cars just sitting there. And I go, I wonder what the stocks are doing. So I look at the stock market, it drops and I try to buy stocks in uh, enterprise. Well, they're, they're not private. They're private. They're not publicly traded. So I ended up buying something for, um, Carnival Cruise Line, because I hear, I, I read somewhere that they were 80% of the market, right, in cruises. And I said, this is a perfect opportunity, right? Stocks are down. That means they're on sale, right? So called my wife. Said, I want a couple thousand to, to invest. So we invested everything I read. My stockbroker, right, over there at uh, Edward Jones, he goes, oh, no. What did he say? What did he say? He goes, I, I feel the market is still volatile. I think we should hold off. I said, I, I, yeah, okay, I appreciate that. I don't care about volatility. I'm not trying to time the bottom. I'm not trying to do anything. I just think that a couple grand is losable, but I think that that company is going to come back, right? They were $60, $60 a share. They were down at $10 a share when I bought them. They kept going down. They went down to seven. My wife's like, they went down to seven. So, eh, but you know, it's okay. You know? <laughs> We're at 29 right now, right? And I, and in June 1st, when they open up, I bet you money, well, I'm betting money that it's going to double again, right? It's going to be right back <laughs> up at 50. So, the, the, the savings that we had was building up. We had, you know, 40 or 50 grand for uh, the house, right? That little two, three thousand dollars that we invested turned into 10 now, I think. Um, that, that was, you know, so like I said, that, that's our savings rate. That's the only side stuff I did. The, the thousand dollars a month that we're saving into the IRA, the three percent that's going into the 401k is also the savings. And, uh, and then we live off of the 40 hour a week W-2. So all overtime from the W-2 goes into savings. And I think we also have some savings rate on the W on, on the 40 hours a week. And there's a little bit that we're still saving there. So the biggest expense that we have besides uh, our uh, uh, rent, right, is uh, food. Because when we went to keto and we stopped buying all of the all of the processed stuff, oh, it got expensive. Now we buy fresh food, right? And it's, it's much more expensive. We do eat at home almost exclusively. So that saves a lot of money too. So that helps with the savings rate as, as well. Did I answer that question correctly? So awesome. No, <laughs> yeah. But, um, and then you're now investing. Like, it, I, my, my guess is between if you're putting down, if you've got a fully funded emergency reserve and you're putting down 50 Gs on rental properties nowadays, um, that you're, you're well past the 100,000 net worth marker. Do you have any kind of, uh, inkling there okay so okay so the money we had for the down payment we got to we got the offer accepted we got into it and then all of a sudden somebody says something like um hey you're a first-time buyer you can you can pull some of the ira money out uh, without a penalty 
but you'll have to pay taxes. I said, oh, okay. So, you know, I sent him a text and, hey, what do you think about this? And he goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you can pull out $10,000. I said, oh, awesome. You know, you just, you know, just let your, your CPA know and we'll do, you'll do the taxes next year. I said, okay, well, 50 just went to 60. Um, well, I was in the union for a bunch of years, so I called the pension. They said, well, there's a COVID relief program. Did you ever lose any hours? I said, yeah, I lost hours, you know. Uh, then the dip there at the, the first two weeks, we, we, we lost, we lost hours and he goes, okay, so you lost income. You can pull out some, how much can I pull out? You can pull out either up to $20,000. I said, okay. So I said, what do I do? Fill this out. So they sent me, uh, 14,000 because they kept 20%. They got to go to taxes, right? Penalty free. So it got a little bit of pension money. All of a sudden now I'm within spitting distance of 20% down on this house. So that 50 just turned into 70 something. We pulled out from a little bit more from our savings than we wanted to. So instead of having 20,000 saved as a backup, I think we're down to 10 plus that, um, plus those stocks that we can sell, right? So, so that's gonna keep us right around the 20 mark. But that got me to the $78,000 that I needed for the closing costs, which I volunteered to pay and 20% down on the house. And the moment that that all happened, right? everything. Everything shifted because suddenly I was like, all that money that I've been working for, saving, grasping, grasping with my little fists is gone, right? And it took a big shift in my mind to realize it's not gone. It's just sitting in this new safe deposit box, right? That has a roof on it. And uh, so that, that, that's when, uh, that's when we kind of, okay, so this is good. Now we can save up for our next one. So now I can take a year or two save up the next 80 grand or the next 20%, who knows what it'll be in two years, right? Whatever 20% will be. But once I realized that that PMI, right? When we were sitting down with the mortgage loan, uh, lender, oh my God, that gives me hives on my soul. I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay insurance for somebody else. That's ridiculous. So I decided I'm allergic to PMI and I will only buy houses when I can get 20% down. And that's, that's our new goal going forward. Oh, but that... I forgot to mention this. We are, we now have a credit card. They, uh, they threw a big fit about us not having a, a credit score, you know, cause that's what happens when you don't have any credit. Right. I said, but is it, is it all Dave says, he's like, he says, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have any credit. Cause he doesn't have any, any credit yeah. cards or anything like that. And he's like, I can't rent the apartment building. I could buy the complex, but I can't, I can't yeah. rent the, you know, a unit in the, in the complex. Exactly. I'm like, I have got what's my debt to income ratio. Awesome. I mean, come on. I don't owe anybody. <laughs> How would I not pay you? No, no, no. You need a credit score. So we got a, we got a secured card, you know, for the thousand dollars. And then we've got a real card with Costco and, you know, and immediately, immediately the money starts flowing again. And so we're going to, I don't know. I'm leave that at home. I don't want that thing on me at all. I like, I like walking around with my $20 in my pocket and, and my, and my bank card, my debit card. And then, Cause that way you have a list of what's going on. It, it seems to flow easier. It has debt. Nope, makes sense. Well, this is this has just been fantastic. I th thank you for sharing all of this. Thank you for the incredible story and journey you've been on here. Mindy, Mindy is right. You do clearly love um, the electrician piece of things. Oh yeah, I lost a hundred pounds. Oh, but then I installed a chandelier. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, yeah. Well, I want to say it's just been so much fun with this. The Go addictive ahead, personality can be used for good too. Yeah. You. Yeah. You know you yeah. you left drugs behind and gained a bunch of weight, but your addictive personality allowed you to stick to it and get rid of the weight. There's a lot of people who don't stick to it and get rid of the weight. It allowed you to save money, stick to the, the getting rid of debt phase that is so difficult for a lot of people. Um, I am going to give you some advice because this is still my show, even though you're the guest and the star today, uh, definitely teach your child how to do electricity, because even if he doesn't go be an electrician, he'll know how to do it. My husband didn't learn a lot from his dad and his dad passed last summer. And then he decided that he was going to finish off the basement. And so he's learning how to do electricity. We put it in a sub panel. We, he put in a sub panel. I did do, I did nothing. I didn't even go buy the parts this time. That used to be my job to go to Home Depot all the time and buy all the parts. But he put in a sub panel, he ran all the electricity, he did all the things, but it took him longer because he was still kind of figuring it out. He had a bit of a an idea. Um, but being 
in the trades, I bet you know a guy who does drywall really awesome. And I bet you know a great plumber. And you can, when you have these houses that, because you're going to discover houses that are dumps. You're going to be like, oh, wait, I could buy, like you have everything perfect except electric. That's fabulous. But have everything perfect besides everything. And then you call up your friend, Bob, the roofer. Hey, can we swap some jobs? You do the roofing on my job and I will come do the electricity on your job. And you call up, you know, Phil, the the plumber. Did I say Bob, the plumber? I meant Bob, the roofer, Phil, the plumber, call up (laughs) Phil and be like, Hey, let's swap and just go on and on and on. And these guys are going to start becoming your group. You know who the good drywaller is and who the lazy bum is who never shows up on time. You know, being in the trades gives you such an advantage to your investing. I bet next year, maybe two years, because the market's kind of crazy right now, you're going to be sitting on this empire of formerly crappy houses that are now amazing and wonderful because of all the things that you know. That's that's funny. That's what's Tana. Yeah, reach out to those little old ladies. That that eight hours you're working is what keeps us paying the bills, but. Those others, that's what's building the empire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's funny. The, um, when we moved into the house, I don't like porch lights, right? Because they're kind of, they get in your eyes. So I immediately removed the porch light and I put in some little puck lights up above. So the whole front of my house is lit. It's really pretty. So it's got brand new paint. It's light down. While I was putting those in, I had my poles in there. And all of a sudden, the pole goes shooting inside the house. And I'm like, what the hell? And I run up and put my head in the attic. And there's my boy. He goes, oh, sorry, Dad. I pulled the wrong wire. Right? He, that was the best day of my life. He was up there pulling wire with me. First of all, I'm crawling in the attic. He's standing up walking. And it, we, were just, we ran all those wires together, and it was so awesome. It was so great. So, yeah, I can't wait to teach him everything, you know. And it's starting now. You know, he already knows what, what this wire is, what that wire is, you know. And, you know, we just I throw quizzes at him whenever I can. And he can start earning money with you when he's, I don't know, 13, oh, 14, 15. Yeah. So, yeah, how early can you start paying him a, a W-2 legitimately right so 10 12 in a family business something like that because i want i want to get an ira started for him a roth ira as quickly as i can because when i see those compound interest charts that blows my mind yeah he needs to have earned income and i don't know how early you can start paying him i do know that you have to pay him what you would be paying somebody else so you can't pay him six thousand dollars to help you run wires in the attic for an hour but you can pay him $15 an hour if that's what you would also pay somebody else. Sure. I'll give him minimum wage. I don't mind. I just want to get it started, you know? Exactly. If, if, yeah. If I can get him something, pay a little bit of taxes and get a Roth IRA rolling. Oh, and then goodness. he just... would need to file taxes. He would need to file. Um, but I think, and don't quote me on this, I only know enough to be dangerous, but I think 12000 is the minimum income that he would need to file and pay taxes. I think he still has to file taxes, but he doesn't owe any taxes because he's not making enough money. So when you, and his limit is $6,000 to contribute to the Roth IRA, just like yours is. So until next year, when you can do, oh, wait, the Roth is only sixty one. 7,000. A- I'm sorry, 7,000 for next year after 50. And then, um, but the 401k goes up, I think to 24,000 for you. So super excited to turn 50. Uh, but yeah, you can, I don't know if he can earn income at six as an electrical apprentice, but it's something like in the family business it's something like 10 or 12 is what somebody was saying, but I'll talk to my CPA about it. Yeah, yeah. Talk to your CPA and ask. Uh, get the uh, get the the actual number, and then as soon as he does, boom, you've got an assistant who's earning income, so he can contribute to his Roth IRA. Yep, I'm very excited about that for him. I'm very excited for him too. Well, th- this has just been again a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Um, do you have anything else you want to add or any parts of your story that we should highlight before we get on to closing out the show with the famous four? I don't know. Um, the retirement to me looks a lot like me driving around, taking care of my own rentals. That's, that's the goal, right? Just get enough of those that I can step away from the W2, right? Have enough income there. Then I can just, cause I can never quit. 
right? I can never quit working. The, one of the things they tell you at the uh, down at the union hall is like the number one killer is retirement, right? Retirement kills because guys go home, sit down, and croak, right? So I don't want that. So I'm going to work until I can't, you know, until they haul me out feet first. Fair enough. So you're just going to keep buying rentals every year, it sounds like, or more frequently if you can. Yeah. What's that book? How to How to Get Rich Slow? <laughs> I, I don't think it'll be that slow for you based on what I'm hearing here, especially if you can find more properties that need electrical work. So yeah, yeah I, everything's new except for the electricity. Uh, well, great. <laughs> yeah. Z- zero <laughs> dip in my, uh, in my work hours for the, this whole COVID. In fact, it went up because everybody suddenly needed a spa. I put in more spas this last year than I have in all the other years combined. Right. Everybody sitting at home. Why don't we have a spa? I don't know. Call an electrician, get some power put in. Mm, it, that is crazy. crazy. It is. Okay, Chris, as wonderful as this show was, we are not done yet. We still have our famous four, which is the same five questions we ask of all of our guests. The first one is, what is your favorite finance book? Without a doubt, the book that changed it for us was Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. Um, we read that, I listened to the podcast. I buy them. He, he, he sells them every once in a while for 10 bucks a piece. And so I'll buy a book, uh, 10 and 12 of them. And I hand them out like Tic Tacs. If, if you're a young person on my job, you're going to get a strong talking to about <laughs> retirement. And you're going to get that book pushed into your hands. Uh, I had one kid, I gave him the book and I could tell right away he wasn't going to open it. And so uh, the next day when I saw him at work, I said, did you find that $20 bill I left in there? And he said, what? And then the next day he came back to work. He goes, there's no $20 bill in there. Oh, yeah, but now you're looking at it. So start reading it. You know? <laughs> that is by far the book that did it all for me. That's awesome. What was your biggest money mistake? The new cars. I mean, well, okay. Up into the drugs. Let's just say that whole, those three decades were a money mistake. After that, um, in the sober lifetime, the new cars, right? It was just so much money gone so fast, right? The minute, the minute they handed you the keys, it, it stopped being a $25,000 car and became a $17,000 car, right? That was terrible. Nope. Love it. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite answer. What was your biggest what? money mistake? Well, as a former homeless drug addict, new cars. That is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody says so... new cars. And that is so true. If you were thinking about buying a new car, stop. Don't buy it. That is your biggest money mistake. Buy. And I'm talking like a brand new. What is it? 2021? Brand new 2021 or 2022? Do they have 2022s yet? I don't know. I don't know how that works. But yeah, the brand new car. Don't buy it. Buy a used car. Okay. What is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out besides don't buy a new car? Go try fail. That is how you succeed. You have to try. You have to fail. You have to learn from it and you keep going. And the other thing is, is it's never too late. It's never too late. You know, being completely upside down. You know, we we had a a house a house's worth of debt when our when our son was born. So we we had no value. We were negative a hundred percent, right? We we didn't have a house to show for it. But now here we are. We have a house. We I, I've got a savings. I've got a good strong business on the side. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got a wonderful son. He's so kind, and it's just it's it's a it's never too late. Go try, fail, start today. Love it. Thank you. That That's really powerful advice. Um, what's your favorite joke to tell at construction job sites? Well, okay. I've got, okay. It's a joke you've heard. I know because you did a pirate off with some guy in the past, but it, many may not know this. So here it is. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. What's a pirate's favorite letter? Uh, arr. You would think so, matey, but it's the C. <laughs> Love it. All right, a well, couple, couple, couple pirate jokes here. What, what's a pirate's uh, favorite sport? Hopskip. Archery. What's a pirate's? <laughs> what, what, what's a pirate's uh, favorite uh, South American country? Argentina. Argentina, yes. <laughs> right. What what's a pirate's favorite ancient Greek mathematician? 
Aristotle. Oh, no. Archimedes. Yeah, or Aristotle. Archimedes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's what's a pirate's favorite United States president? <laughs> You've got them all right here on the tip of your tongue, too. That's the best part of this. Oh. I don't know. It's Bill Clinton. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> But really, it's because he's from Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> All right, Chris, where can I people quit. find out more about you? <laughs> I'm in Carson City. Come visit me. Um, I'm on Facebook, T. Christopher Colton. Um, and that's about it. I, I shut down the blog last year because I got too busy. So I just, why am I paying money for this website? So I, I shut that down. So T. Christopher Colton, if you want to look me up on Facebook. And, uh, you know, and I'm here in Nevada. Come visit. Don't come right. here and buy anything, though. <laughs> and you're in our uh, Bigger Pockets Money Facebook group at Bigger Pockets oh, yeah, at Facebook.com course, course. slash groups slash BP Money. And, and we actually found Chris because he posted something that got like 1 million likes uh, in the group about his story. And that's how we, we, we came across your, your incredible story here to get you on the show. So thank, thank you so much for posting that and for agreeing to come on and share it here today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This was a fantastic story. And I really appreciate your time. Uh, and we will see you around the Facebook group. Thank you so much again. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, Scott, that was Chris Colton. What did you think of his story? I, I like I said earlier in the in the intro, this was this was the 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 mother of all financial journey stories that that I've heard so far um, or, or come across. That the amount of debt, the amount of challenges he has in his background. The, the the casual hundred pound weight loss as part of that journey, um, the 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 position of pride and joy and, and and gratitude that he has today after achieving all of that. I mean, it was just it's just amazing to see what's going on here. And now he's a real estate investor. I'm going to retire early. I bet this is it's just it's just phenomenal. And it was so much fun to interview Chris. Yeah, he was a really great person to talk to. And you know, I I want to point out that school was not his thing. And there's a lot of people who are our age who were forced into school. You, you go to college after you graduate from high school and that's just how it goes. And I want to say to people who are listening right now, if you've got a kid that is just not getting it done in high school, it's just not his thing or her thing. You, you can just tell that they're struggling. Introduce them to the trades. Maybe their face can light up just like Chris's. He's talking about helping people, and that's really where he gets his joy. When you go to a job and you know that you're horrible at it, you just, it weighs on you. I've been in a lot of jobs where I was not very good at it. I knew I wasn't very good at it. I'm like, man, I just feel horrible. Chris, I can tell, has just the joy in his life when he's helping somebody. He's good at what he does. He enjoys doing it and he's good at it. Don't force your kid into some college that they don't really want to go to, that it just it's going to be another slog for them. There are other options where you can still make really good money. Did you hear him say $100,000? His kid is going to have the ability to make $100,000 right out of high school. His kid's going to have the ability to make $100,000 in high school just by learning the trades from somebody who so obviously enjoys it. And I am so excited for everything in Chris's life and Chris's son's life coming up. Just the, the possibilities that are opening up are just huge. And every aspect of Chris's story, I have heard people ask, how do I get started later in life? How can I still do it? Here's a way that you can get started later in life. How can I do this if I'm getting ready to change a career? Well, here we go. Chris changed careers two or three times. How can I do this when I had so much debt? Well, here's Chris's story of paying off so much debt. And it's just all these different things add up to all these. So many people are going to get so much out of this. And I'm so excited that he came today. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have anything to add there aside <laughs> from I, just reiterating his last piece of advice his, his, in the famous four there, which is just it's never too late to get started on that. So um you know, he, he, he just got started and he has never stopped. He, he has not stopped in six, seven, eight, nine years now in, on his journey of just hustling and, and building a better life for himself and his family. Yep. And he is now crushing it. And I'm so excited. Okay, Scott. Let, let's help him out even more here before we exit, Mindy. Um, so 
If you are in the Carson City, Nevada or surrounding area, Chris's company is C2 Electric. Um, and so he picks up the phone and answers that. And so let's, uh, if, if you need anything done, you're having trouble finding an electrician, give him a call and maybe we can help him uh, get that next rental property just a little bit faster. <laughs> Yes. Chris clearly knows what he's doing. So give him a call and he will. He said after we stopped recording, he said, oh, my slogan is I'll answer your call. I answer every phone call, which is huge. If you have never tried to look for. That's a good that's a good slogan for an electrician company, yeah, for electrical company. That you know, it's, it's hard enough to get them to answer. <laughs> yeah. No, go, go give, uh, go give Chris a call and see if, uh, and, and, and give him a chance to compete for your business. Um, we don't, we don't usually plug businesses like this, but we'll, we'll make an exception here on the show. <laughs> okay. Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do From it. From episode 193 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen saying next time bring more cookies. <laughs> 